Okay, well, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have here this morning to continue to look into your word and the statements of the spirit of prophecy regarding the time that we are living in. And we ask that your spirit can be here as we do a quick review and as we look into a new set of questions in the crisis ahead. Um, we just pray that your spirit can speak to each heart and that you can draw us close to you and to one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again. And uh, so just a quick review of last week. We had addressed this point regarding Satan's personation of Christ and uh, Robert W. Olson. So back in, I guess it would be 1984 when I was, uh, let me see, 84, 85, 86, somewhere in there. Let me think, what year would that be? I know it's probably 85. So 1985, we were studying this in the upper room Bible studies in the attic of my house. When we came to this section, I, I spent some time studying that out and the importance of it. So he had this position, which I, I think is pretty common amongst Advents, that Satan's personation of Christ occurs before the close of probation. But as I looked at the statements in the spirit of prophecy that he had directed us to, I didn't agree with his uh, conclusion, right? So he says here, I'm just going to read again what he wrote. Sisters White's use of the phrase, the last remnant of time, and her use of the six plague language in describing Satan's dramatic appearance as Christ are considered to be compelling arguments in favor of locating this deception at the time of the sixth plague. Now, that's not the only reason. The reason is she places it the time of Jacob's trouble as the sixth plague and that this occurs at that time so it it's it's not just that she uses this language so anybody who reads the chapter the time of trouble and the great controversy it, it, it would be pretty clear now bev family a friend of mine back then who i considered an old lady even though she was only like 65 66 at that time but uh she she had taken the position uh dealing with now so we looked at that last week where it says now and try to to move this Satan's personation of Christ prior to the close of probation. But uh, I I could not follow her reasoning. And and so he, Olson basically has a similar type of reasoning. Now, I could be wrong, but it, I don't think I'm wrong because I've spent time looking at this. And, and I can't see how they could be correct, how he could be correct. So he says, this line of reason is not necessarily conclusive, however. The phrase, the last remnant of time, does not point to the future alone. Sister White says that we are in this time now. Satan has a powerful general has taken the field, and in this last remnant of time, he is working through all conceivable methods to close the door against light that God would have come to his people. So obviously, I would agree, the last remnant of time does not mean you know, just after the close of probation. And she says also, uh, we are living in the last remnant of time. So that means we're, we're living in the time that is remaining, right? Of course, that time has been extended, but I, I've never made the argument from the last remnant of time to put Satan's personation of Christ after the close of probation. And then he says, furthermore, her use of the sixth plague language is not limited to some future period. It is true that the devil go, devil's go forth to the whole world at the time of the sixth plague. But this is exactly what Satan is doing today. The spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them under his banner, to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Now that's in 7 Bible Commentary 983. And um, so I'm going to look at that statement and it's going to be taken from somewhere where else i'm going to do it this way okay so she says this a um, couple places so it's taken from trying to find where it's so when we look at this in seven bible commentary it's just it's basically just one sentence uh that's here 
Um, it's in last day events. Okay, let me see here. So we got, it's manuscript 1A, 1890. Um, so I'm going to look at that actual manuscript here. I should share that screen. I don't think I have it here, though. This computer, I don't have that. So I'm going to have to go to the other computer. Just hang on. Um, well, I'll read what we have here. Okay. So the present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels, angels are already girded, uh, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them under his banner, to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict. Fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Skepticism is prevailing everywhere. Ungodliness abounds. The faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. So I'm not going to be able to go to that manuscript. But if you read the context here, what do, what do we see? Is Ellen White uh, placing this in, in the way that he's trying to use this? That is, he's trying to say, and he's just going to take the spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. But she is putting this, this at the time of the plagues, which he's not putting that part of the statement there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right. The, the, he's not justified in using this statement to support his argument. Just because Satan is gathering now, just because that work is now occurring, we understand that the deceptive work is happening. It doesn't logically follow that uh, what what is in the sixth plague itself, which is Satan's personation of Christ it can then be moved as occurring before the close of probation. Does that make sense? I'm not saying it very well. From what I understand, he's only quoting part of it. He's... Yeah, yeah. So he's going to just start with the spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. And uh, Satan is also mustering his forces of evil going forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's all he's going to quote. But if we look at the, the context here, so it's true, Satan is gathering. I mean, that work is happening. But in the sixth plague, the sixth plague is specific to there's going to be these three unclean spirits like frogs. It's in the chapter, the time of trouble that Ellen White talks about, Satan's master overmastering delusion, right? that it's, it's occurring in connection with the death decree that occurs during the sixth plague. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. So for him to just take part of this statement and get it to say something that it doesn't say, right? I mean, sure, Satan is still working. We know he's working now, right? And, and that's his purpose. But that doesn't place... Satan's personation of Christ prior to the close of probation or prior to the sixth plague, right? Does anybody disagree with me that I could be wrong in how I'm reasoning? Well, I'm just wondering if if it says that in the rest of the quote or something, or just well, based on you see the quote here. On... Here's what he's quoting from, right? Mm -hmm. So he's going to take about. Angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world, right? So, so clearly she is placing this, this last battle during the time of the plagues, right, in this statement. So the fact that the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world has nothing to do with trying to put Satan's personation of Christ before the close of probation or before the plagues. Hey Kelly, is the spirit is the spirit of God withdrawn when the plagues start? No, the spirit of God's already withdrawing. We we can see that happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constantly it, it is, yes, Theodore. 
Is the Spirit of God withdrawn at the time when the last plagues? Not, not withdrawing, but withdrawn. From the world, yes. Right. So the Spirit of God ceases to strive with men at the time when the plagues start. There's no more. Okay. Probation is yes. Probation is closed. Yeah. Now, now the part that he that, focused. That another on, question. Yeah. That another question. It just doesn't. It escapes me right now. Yeah. Now the fact that Satan is also mustering his forces of evil, going forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world, to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That she puts that in the present tense. We understand that that is going on as well. She's using that language. She's That is, she's using the language of the sixth plague as applying to the present time. But she's still placing this as something that occurs during the plagues, right? So she's just saying, just as he's going to do that in the end time, he's already doing that work. Like the Antichrist is already doing his work, just as Paul says in his day. Right. So but it doesn't mean that there isn't a specific time that the Antichrist comes or that there isn't a specific time that Satan. So when she says Satan is to make most powerful efforts for the mastery in the last great conflict, conflict, fundamental principles will be brought out and decisions made in regard to them. Right. So. So we can see that that work goes on prior to the sixth plague. The sixth plague is just the culmination of all of that work. Right. And so we'd have to say when the faith of individual members of the church will be tested as though there were not another person in the world. That would be the time of Jacob's trouble. Right. So so she's connecting with what's happening now to what's going to happen in the future. But that doesn't put Satan's personation of Christ now or, or prior to the close of probation. It doesn't take away all the other things that she has said now. OK. So what is the significance of this? Why do I make so much importance on this point, which is not generally accepted by Adventists? We talked about it last week. Why is it wrong to put Satan's personation of Christ prior to the close of probation? What, how would that affect our understanding of last day events? Is anybody going to answer that question? Nobody know the answer? I'm thinking about it. Do I, um... The, Theodore. Yeah, well, we talked about it last week, so maybe it didn't sink in. Well, one thing is it's a deception because, um, you know, we were talking about it being um, it, the very elect would be deceived, and um, if if possible, and they can't be deceived because it's after after that time frame. Mm -hmm. So. So putting it before will, de you know, will deceive a lot of people. Okay. So I'm not, yeah, I understand kind of what you're saying. So, so obviously having the order of events uh, is important to some degree, right? So we know that there are things that have to occur. Well, some people, well, some people would tell you if it, why would you, why would you have um, Satan's deception after, to close the probation because you he wouldn't have to, he wouldn't be able to deceive nobody. Right. But what would be the purpose? The purpose is if he could deceive the very elect, he would win. Because Jesus has declared them righteous. Right. So so we connected to that with the scapegoat trying to escape from the hands of the fit man. That's the language Ellen White uses regarding that. So at that point, when Christ comes out of the most holy place, he's going to place those sins upon the head of the scapegoat, Satan. And that begins not at the second coming, but at the close of probation. Right. So that period prior to the second coming from from the close of probation to the second coming is that opportunity for Satan to prove Christ wrong. Right. So this is an important point within Adventism, understanding the role of the final generation. It's not really just about knowing the timing of events. 
It's understanding the purpose of these events. Now, do you think many Adventists know that the sins are confessed upon the head of the scapegoat at the close of probation? Where, where would ge Adventists generally try to put that type, the, the anti-type? So the, the, the symbol of the sins being confessed upon the head of the scapegoat, where will they generally place them? In my experience with Seventh-day Adventists. It always made sense to do it at the time of the close of probation. It, or no, at, at, at the time when, I always kind of thought it was at, at the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium? Okay. Yeah, when... Satan is destroyed. I kind of thought that. Yeah, yeah, most people would put it at the beginning of the millennium, right? Because they'd look at that thousand years as the time of the scapegoat in the wilderness, right? But he's going to be led by a fit man into the wilderness. It would be right? after the day of atonement, would right at right at the day of atonement. Would. Well, when Christ comes out of yeah, so we're saying it's when Christ comes out of the most holy place. The high priest, he would come out of the most holy place, then confess the sins upon the head right. of the scape. And we are saying that that typifies the close of probation. Right. Right. That's what Alan White says. Okay. Right. And then, um, so the fit man is leading the goat into the wilderness. That's the period from the close of probation to the second coming. Yeah, Jeff? Does the fit man represent Christ? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is which is one of the reasons why you wouldn't have uh, uh, the goat, the the uh, the scapegoat represent Christ, because then Christ would be leading Christ, right? That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I mean, this is something I've spent a lot of time studying and discussing and thinking about and. You know, so it, it could be one of my little pet pet theories or whatever, you know, from some people's perspective, they would think it's not very important. But but this goes back, you know, for me, you know, 40 years of of contemplating this, studying and discussing it with different people, uh, doing presentations on it, sermons on it and finding that Adventists just haven't thought about it very closely. Right. It's just, you know, there's just kind of assumptions that, you know, we have just preconceived notions or impressions that we get. And to actually take time studying it from the spirit of prophecy or from the Bible is generally not done. And I find that this is a weakness in Adventist thinking that often when they're challenged by uh, evangelicals on the point of the Lord's goat or the scapegoat, they really don't know how to answer because there are things that assumptions that are built in as Adventists that we've just come to accept that we, we don't know how to show from scripture. So I, I think it's an important issue. Okay. Yeah. If we go by the sanctuary service, right, and we got and we got he comes out of the most holy rooms and he places his hand on the scapegoat, right? Yeah. And he confesses the sins over the goat. Yeah, the right. righteous. Sins of the righteous. So people say, well, you have Satan as your sin bearer. Right. right? That's interpret it. Okay. All right. And we and we're gonna put that at the sixth plague. No, that's at the close of probation. That's at the close of probation. Okay. Yeah. The sixth plague is Satan trying to escape from the hand of the fit man. During those plagues, this is when Satan is having his opportunity. To prove Christ wrong. Because Christ has declared the wicked is wicked. Oh, okay. God pours out the plagues and none of the wicked turn from their wickedness. Their heart is not changed, even though they, the judgments of God have come upon the earth. I see and, now. Okay. And the righteous don't turn from their righteousness. Even though Satan's over, almost overmastering deception when he personates Christ is, is revealed. Right. So, I mean, the way that I sort of pictured it is that, you know, it's going to appear to us that we are wrong. That is, it's going to be so powerful just from a perception point of view 
that you, that you, the, he is Christ. The only thing we have to cling to is Christ. Well, you had a you had an um, example of that of Job, Job, right? Because he was tempted by Satan too, right? Yeah. And and Jacob, and, time yeah, and Jacob is what, is what the Bible compares yeah. it to, yeah. right? So all he can do is cling to Christ, and that's all the righteous can do. They have no sense that they are righteous, right? It appears to them that they are the wicked, right, from appearances. It is very parallel to Jesus when Satan comes to him in the wilderness. If thou be the son of God, turns these stones into bread. If you read in the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White's quite clear that it appeared to Jesus that Satan his accusation was that you are the fallen angel. And it appeared to Jesus in his state that he was not the son of God, right? If he went by appearances, he would say, well, I'm not the son of God. But he had heard his father's voice 40 days previous. And it's to those words that he clung. Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So, so Jesus clung to those words and then he quotes Deuteronomy, where the that I fed you with manna 40 years, that you may know that which your fathers did not know, and which you do not know, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Right? So Jesus quotes that. So he's he's going to trust upon the word of God rather than his own perception and feelings. And that's the way the 144,000 are going to be. Because it will appear to them, even though they cannot remember any actual sins, just like Christ had no actual sins to remember. Uh, 144,000 sins have been blotted out. They can't bring to the remembrance, but they have a sense of their unworthiness. And because they are changed in character, they will be able to pass that test. And this to me is, is it's the whole point of the message of the sanctuary in Adventism. Reason I mentioned Job, reason I mentioned Job was because <laughs> Satan had that same opportunity to make Job sin, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Job and, and he couldn't and he yeah. couldn't win. They're both, Satan, yeah, they're both Satan. good illustrations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't arguing with your illustration. I'm just saying that, but it is the time of Jacob's trouble, mm-hmm. so that's the primary application. But Job is is relevant as well. Okay, so so I think it's important, and to me, it's one of the reasons I, I wanted to study this uh, booklet. Now, the next section here we're going to look at, dealing with the Holy Spirit. What was Christ's favorite favorite subject? Christ, the great teacher, had an infinite variety of subjects from which to choose, but the one upon which he dwelt most largely was the endowment of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if that means it was his favorite subject. <laughs> But it is definitely the one upon which he dwelt most largely. It was one, the one upon which he dwelt most largely. And, and of course, we know this uh, in the book of John, of course. Uh, there's a whole section dealing with uh, this work that the Spirit's going to do, the Comforter. You know, tied in with a lot of these illustrations about Christ himself. But the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, right? So that's... Now, so it's good, he's going to ask lots of questions. Now, this, of course, is within Adventism. We've had a real problem with the Holy Spirit in, in that uh, we have the anti-Trinitarians uh, arguing over this. And, and I think also a distortion because of Pentecostalism. So, so I've mentioned this before, but uh, I read a book by uh, Broome. Eroy Froome, uh, back in, would have been in 1980, I think I read it in 1985, um, called The Coming of the Comforter, and I was not very impressed. So I had read Froome's uh, A Movement of Destiny prior to that, and then I picked up a, a used copy of his book at the ABC, a paperback version of it, and um, read that, and was was I, I would use the word of Paul basically. I mean, uh, I, I was I was disgusted. I, I could not believe that an Adventist author 
could have written that book. It, it, it was not Adventist. And, and, and the thing that was also really disturbing is that, that Adventist didn't seem to, to notice. It was almost as if Adventists had not understood God's word. And and really, what he presented in the idea in the, in that book was really, uh, I don't know, it, you know, I mean, it's been a long time since I read the book. I have I have looked at parts of it since then. I haven't read the whole thing again, like I did. What was originally. the main What was the main theme of the book? Well, basically, uh, he talks about how that Adventists don't know anything about the Holy Spirit, and then he basically had to study non-Adventist books to learn anything about it. Um, that was one thing. But basically, what he's describing is is what I would call spiritualism. You know, his ideas of what the Holy Spirit was and how how we receive the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit and so forth was really just Pentecostalism. It it's, uh, it wasn't my understanding that I got from the Bible. So a lot of focus upon the Holy Spirit as an individual person, and I'm not saying the Holy Spirit's not a person, but the Holy Spirit does not reveal himself. See, and, you know, the Holy Spirit reveals Christ, and Christ reveals the Father. We don't see the Father, and we don't see the Holy Spirit, but we do see Christ. And it's in the person of Christ that we come to contact with God. So when people talk about the Holy Spirit, my understanding of what, what they're doing is, is it's very easy to, to imagine that you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because it's something that's, that's really sort of, uh, what's the word? It's vague, right? It, it becomes very vague. And that's what we see in Pentecostalism, this idea that we have, that, you know, people, you know, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, they get tongues or whatever, all of these types of things. And really, the, what's the evidence uh, that we have the Spirit of God? Are, are the gifts of the Spirit evidence that we have the Holy Spirit? What's the evidence, according to the Bible? Fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. Really. The fruits of the Spirit, right? Now, God will give the gifts uh, severally or individually as he will, but they're never used as evidence that we have the Holy Spirit. It's the fruits of the Spirit that are the evidence. I don't really want to look at Froome's book, but um, I, I just want you to keep that in mind that Adventists have a distorted perception about the Holy Spirit uh, that has in part uh, created the environment that we have today regarding anti-Trinitarianism. So, okay, so we're going to look at the next question. In God's plan for our redemption, how important is the gift of his spirit? In the gift of the spirit, Jesus gave to man the highest good that heaven could bestow. And that's from Our High Calling, page 150. Before offering himself as the sacrificial victim, Christ sought for the most essential and complete gift to bestow upon his followers, a gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of grace. I will pray the Father, he said, and he shall give you another comforter. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that people could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. Only those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. Okay, so we can see that the importance here of the Holy Spirit. Now, when it says, I will pray the Father, and he said, he shall give you another comforter, we understand that that word comforter in Greek is paraclete, um, and it means like an advocate. That is like a an advocate in in a court case, right? So now, if it's another comforter, we know that this this when Jesus talks about this, he says, "I will be with you." So we know that the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, Christ's presence is made known to the believer. So when we think about the Holy Spirit's presence as an individual person, the Holy Spirit does not reveal Himself; He reveals Christ. 
what why is that important why is it important to know that the holy spirit even though he's a person and and in you know distinct as a person why is it that we don't we don't commune with the holy spirit per se we commune with christ through the holy spirit why is that an important a detail nobody wants to answer that question now we, we had a study dealing with um uh you know christ's nature and in christ he came and he took upon himself human nature and he reveals the love of the father right so the father's character is revealed in christ jesus is the son of god he's the son of god from eternity he didn't just become the son of god when he was uh, became a human right did the Holy Spirit take upon himself human nature? Oh. Okay, so we're, we're going to look at a statement. Um, and and I, I don't have answers to some of these questions. But uh, this is a statement from uh, Spirit of Prophecy. So there are some statements. I, I put together a collection of statements regarding the Holy Spirit. And let me see if this will work. I don't know how to do this. Okay, anyway, I'll just read them um, because I can't make it so that they work. Oh, maybe I can do it this way. There we go. So I have a bunch of statements um, in my e-sort, so I'll put them on the screen. Now, some of these statements, I'm going to have some statements mixed in here that aren't Ellen White statements. Uh, I put this together originally uh, to share with someone and... Um, to see if they could tell me which statements were spirit of prophecy statements and which ones weren't. Uh, people generally couldn't tell. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the comforter in Christ's name. He person personifies Christ, yet is a distinct personality. So that's uh, uh, manuscript releases number 1487. So one of the things we see about the Holy Spirit, he personifies Christ. That is, he reveals the person of Christ. He doesn't reveal himself, right? Yet he is a distinct personality. That's a pretty important statement in the spirit of prophecy. Now, she she says a couple of other things, one from Spalding and McGann collection. I say and have ever said that I will not engage in controversy with anyone in regard to the nature and personality of God, that those who try to describe God know that on such a subject silences eloquence. Let the scriptures be read in simple faith and let each one form his conceptions of God from his inspired word. All right, so Spalding again, 329. Now, there's a statement here from James White, which uh, uh, anti-Trinitarian Jews, here along with other Catholic heirs, we might mention the Trinity, which does away with the personality of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. So, so people will note that James White rejects the idea of the Trinity, but that's not a spirit of prophecy statement. And then we would have to do a study on that. And then here we have another quote from Wilcox, M.C. Wilcox, which I'm not going to read. But um, so here, thus, uh, so, but this one here by Wilcox where he says, thus the spirit is personified. Well, I guess I'll read both these statements. And then see how this issue gets confused. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the mighty energy of the Godhead, the life and power of God flowing out from him in all parts of the universe and thus making a living connection between his throne and all creation. Now, do we agree with that statement by Wilcox? That's from 1911. So Ellen White was still alive at that time. Do we agree with that statement? No. It says living connection. Yeah, I, I wouldn't agree with that statement. Yeah, so I was wondering. And then he says, thus the spirit is personified in Christ and God, but never revealed as a separate person. So this would seem to contradict Ellen White's statement, where yet he is a distinct personality, right? So you can see that for, for within Adventism, there's a lot of confusion regarding uh, the Holy Spirit. Even in 1911, uh, Will Cox is one of the guys who actually promoted the idea of the Trinity, that the word Trinity. So, so you can see here, even in his confusion on this matter, it's something that has sort of persisted within Adventism. 
which is why I think that there's a problem. The problem exists, as I've seen uh, pastors not understand the Godhead or the Trinity, presenting it from the pulpit and just making everyone more and more confused. Does and, he, does the, well, never mind. I ain't going to ask that question. Okay. Now, this statement here, uh, this is the one that I wanted to look at when I went here. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that he should leave them, go to his father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He would represent himself as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. Okay, so, um, and I've had discussions with many people regarding this quote, and I've seen all kinds of ways in which people have tried to understand it. So the first thing is, what does it mean to be divested of something? So the Holy Spirit is himself divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. What does that, what does divested mean? Anybody know? He's free of it. He he did not take it up. So, well, yeah, you just don't have it. In order to be divested, you first have to be vested. Vested. Right. Right? Right. You can't be divested of something that you didn't have. So, the Holy Spirit, in a sense, did take up the personality of humanity in Christ as a human being was the holy spirit dwelling in christ as a human being yes so he was conceived of the holy spirit i never right? thought of that before <laughs> okay. oh okay, that makes sense in that way he okay. did invest himself in humanity yeah, or with yeah. humanity yeah. so okay. yeah invest invested or you know or vested right so he took upon himself that is the holy spirit so, and, and this is part of the problem with the idea of the Godhead that, that, that and the Trinity is first, it's not something that I believe that can be fully understood. But you can't say that, you know, the Holy Spirit exists only as a distinct from the Father and the Son. That is, that they are one, right? That they have one mind, one purpose, one intent. And but we don't fully understand it, right? We know that, um, you know, Christ is the Son, and he's been the Son of God from eternity. So so there are different theories that people have, but I, I try not to go beyond the inspired statements and to speculate. But one we can see here is that the Holy Spirit is himself, that is, I, that is Jesus, that's the way that I take it, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. That is, that is why she can say he would represent himself, that is Christ again, the same himself, as present in all places by his Holy Spirit as the omnipresent. So when the Holy Spirit comes to us, it is Christ that comes to us. Is, is that clear? Makes sense. I, uh, I do remember, I do remember one time, once, mm -hmm. I thought, I'm, I'm going to pray to the Holy Spirit. And it fell so flat. It just, there was nothing there. Yeah. Didn't get any, oh. any kind of response. Yeah. Now, um, and, and I would agree that when we pray, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son and through the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the formula I use because that's what's revealed in Scripture. I talk to Christ when as Jesus well. Says it. Yeah. Yeah, I know many people do. I don't. You know, I mean, sometimes I will address Jesus, but generally I address the Father. Well, you got Gethsemane. Where did Jesus go? He went and prayed to the Father, right? And and he taught us to pray to the Father, yeah, right? That's right. To me, it's not, it's not that important of an issue. And I did write a, a song once, you know, Come Holy Spirit Awaken, right? So I was, in a sense, praying for the Holy Spirit to do a work upon me, uh, which he did. 
But this idea of praying to the Holy Spirit in the way that that people want to do this as like a separate person, I don't think is wise. That there's no is that something. Perhaps that is something the Pentecostal people. Yes. Do. Yeah, and that's one of the things and, that in uh, and, in and, and and when I and when I do say like I I talk to Jesus, it's. It's not like, like generally, yes, I, I pray to the Father. I, my prayers always begin, Heavenly Father, or so on. But I don't know. I guess I, yeah, I, I, I do address don't, Jesus. I don't pray to him, but yeah. yeah. That's what Jesus said, pray to the Father. And also he did say to ask for the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but, but we don't ask for the Holy Spirit from the Holy Spirit. Right. Pray the Father and each give you the Spirit. Right. Okay, Theodore. <laughs> okay, William, you have a comment? No, I didn't have no comment. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so I think this is, you know, there's so much confusion within Ad Adventism regarding this Holy Spirit. So I figured we should address this. Now, this is another favorite of mine from uh, fourth man, 14 Manuscript Releases 179. It is not essential for you to know and be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Holy Spirit is the Comforter, and the Comforter is the Holy Ghost, which is just the, the same thing as the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, which the Father shall send in my name. I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth in you, and shall be in you. John 14, 16, and 17. This refers to the omnipresence of the spirit of Christ, called the comforter. Again, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. There are many mysteries which I do not seek to understand or to explain. They are too high for me and too high for you. On some of these points, silence is golden. Piety, devotion, sanctification of the soul, body, and spirit, this is essential for us all. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So, and, that, and that's why we have the Holy Spirit. It's the omnipresence, and Christ gave that up when he became man, right? Yes. Well, in a sense. like So the Son of God has forever is a man, but through his Spirit, he is everywhere present. But... So how to understand that? I, I don't. I don't fully understand God. It's something beyond us. It's too high for us. But but Christ is forever bearing human nature. He doesn't, you know, stop bearing human nature in order to come to me personally and speak to me. Right. Through his spirit, he does that. And that is a connection with Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't come to me as a separate person that I commune with as separate from Christ. It is Christ that comes to me through the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have to have all three in order <clears throat> to be right. Well, yeah, it's it, we, we need to recognize that there is the Father, there is the Son, and there is the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit, Christ comes to me. Christ reveals the Father. So we, we need all three, right? Because Jesus is a man right now. If there was, if, if his spirit wasn't there, I would have no way to communicate with him, right? All right. Right. So, but what that actually means, you know, technically, I have no idea. And... Um, okay. But that, that, I just wanted to address those, those points. It's kind of interesting when you, when you go to the, um, source document of that manuscript release yeah it's letter seven of 1891 and the first four paragraphs are pretty blunt okay what are they addressing well this um the brother to whom this is written 
And I, I may actually have met this man because I knew a, a family by the name of Chapman and mm-hmm. the family was fairly long lived. Oh yeah. So um, when you were a child, you met the guy? Yeah. Maybe? When I, when I was a teenager. Okay. That's still a child. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> apparently okay. this brother Chapman had the idea that the Holy Spirit was the angel Gabriel. And she had to be very direct with him about some of the things that, that he was looking at and some of the items that he was considering. Yeah. I've, I've seen people even try to say Melchizedek is the Holy Spirit or, you know, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Right. But she's she is very direct about how, and, and this is paragraph three, it is your privilege and your duty to seek for this oneness, this unity, and thus answer the prayer of Christ. This prayer is full of instruction and consolation. And that's the prayer that we find John 17 from verses 17 to 27. As our intercessor in heaven, Christ is ever working for the unity of his people. Now, consider, brothers and sisters, this point. If Christ is ever working for the unity of his people, and we have others that are working not to unity, then there are those that are working against Christ. In order to be in harmony with heaven, we must seek to be one in faith and in practice. So that goes right in line with with what has been being discussed these last several Sabbaths. Yeah, yeah. So, and and yet we try to make all these things issues and conflicts and fight over certain understandings of things, which which I'm not trying to do here in discussing this. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, because I'm dealing with a friend who's become strongly anti-Trinitarian, and I find that when this happens, it really starts to erode um, a person's faith in God. Um, It brings them into other sort of deceptions. I mean, because obviously, you know, we don't really agree with everything that people say about the Trinity or the Godhead or whatever. But, um, and that, and what I think is that the Catholics make it really mystical. Everything's sort of, uh, you know, spiritual or unreal. But then you have just the other extreme where you're trying to make everything really tangible and that becomes a problem as well. So, you know, people will see like any reference almost to the Holy Spirit as some kind of spiritualism. Right. That the the Holy Spirit, you know, is not, you know, that it's pantheism if you have the idea of the spirit everywhere present. Right. That's what this one brother is is arguing and that God isn't really a spirit in in an embodied sort of thing that he's he's just a, a physical body. Right. So he has God as a physical body. Jesus is a physical body and the Holy Spirit. I'm not really sure what he has because doesn't seem to believe in it at all, you know, definitely not as a person, even though we have plain spirit of prophecy statements. And so, you know, I always wonder about this, like when people go into these trying to explain something that can't be explained and just reject plain, straightforward statements in the spirit of prophecy. They have to redefine all kinds of words. They have to say, well, Ellen White didn't really mean what it's, it sounds like she's saying because she was using a different definition of a word like person. And, you know, I just don't find that those things uh, pan out when you look at all the statements. So anyway, the, the point is, you know, we, we need to recognize that the Holy Spirit is to bring us into unity. And instead, you know, this whole discussion has just created a lack of unity both on the side of the church who's trying to fight and people who are trying to fight against and, you know, this sort of error and, and those that are promoting this error, like it, it's not productive in, in either case. So this produces confusion. Yeah. So anyway, we, we will look at this stuff uh, 
again next week. We'll look at the next question. But I, I figured it was important to just discuss this point about the Holy Spirit, that it is the Spirit of Christ, and that the Holy Spirit reveals Christ. So, you know, I don't think it's important. I don't think it's important that everybody understand this issue. Like that it's, it's not, since it's something beyond our comprehension, however a person wishes to sort of formulate in their mind how they think about God, uh, as long as there are certain aspects that, you know, that there's the Father, there's the Son, however they want to think of the Holy Spirit, I'm not really that concerned, as long as it doesn't lead to it being a test, their understanding of it, because I definitely don't make it a test. I don't have a problem. If somebody understands it differently, that's fine. But we do need to know that Jesus came and died for our sins and that he is God. And it wasn't some created being that came and died for our sins. Right? It's, it's, it's God that came and died. Right? It, re it reveals something that God has done, not something some created being has done. Some subordinate in that sense. Now, God did not die in Christ, though. The man part of Christ died. Yes, I understand, but God suffered. <laughs> oh yes, I don't. I, I, yeah, I agree with that certainly. Yeah, obviously, God, God can't die, right? So, but yeah, but you said God, God came and died for us. Yeah, in in our human nature, right? So, right, Christ tasted the second death. Obviously, he experienced that complete separation from his Father, which is the second death. He also, his body experienced the first death, but God experienced, in a sense, what it means to be separated from God, which is really hard to understand. But yeah, people people get caught up in all these, you know, sort of uh, semantical yeah. arguments of words and what, what it really means. And I, I don't think it's that important. There's certain aspects. You need to know that Jesus came and died for your sins and that he He's revealing God. He's not revealing, you know, because if God just sent some created being to die for our sins, it doesn't answer to, uh, it has to be the one who created this world, who who whose character is represented in the Ten Commandments that came and died for us and identifies with us. So anyway, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I was going to Say it's sort of like Satan wanting to go in the council with God and Jesus at the time. You're trying to go in to, into something that that it is only privy to Jesus and God, right? I, I'm not sure I understand what you mean. <laughs> you, well, I don't understand what I'm talking about either. So, okay, you know, well, I can explain it then. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just don't know what you meant. It, it didn't, I, I, I'm just saying that if, if we if we uh, if we sit here and try to try to um, search into something that God has not given us the ability to do, we shouldn't be searching into it. Yeah, and I don't think God could give us the ability to do it. Yeah. The infinite cannot comprehend the infinite. That's right. Yeah, that's what I keep saying too. However, I've gone on 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 the Ellen White disc and I've looked up the three great powers of heaven, and I'm going through those quotes. And she definitely does does refer to the Godhead as the three great powers of heaven. Yeah, the heavenly so it tree. Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, and that that the Holy Spirit is a distinct personality, right? So obviously. You know, people, of course, try to play around with words. But anyway, one thing we know is that the Holy Spirit is not some impersonal energy or force. Right. The Holy Spirit brings Christ to us. OK, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the studies here this Sabbath morning. We pray for your continued presence throughout this day. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in your grace and power in our lives. We pray for one another. We know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is seeking to do a work upon our hearts individually and that we can then cooperate together 
through this agency that, uh, that we, you can guide and direct our steps and the people that we talk with. We pray that you can be with each person who studies these things and that you can lead us into a deeper understanding of your word. Um, thank you again for the Sabbath and the blessings of it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.